You may have noticed that last week's video was quite short. I hope you don't feel short-changed, but I had quite a busy weekend last weekend as I had a long distance trip to do. But wait, as the EV doubters always tell us, EVs can't do long distances. Well, stick with me today and find out whether that is true or not. My mum hasn't seen her family, her brother and his family, since before Covid, and I thought it was about time we resolved that. My uncle hasn't been all that well recently, so the best plan seemed to be for us to pop in for a short visit, a quick coffee, so as not to tire him. I live about 100 miles from my mum, and my uncle lives another 100 miles or so beyond that, so the total journey is about 400 miles round trip. There is a problem with me driving that distance, and that is my back problem. Unfortunately, I need to limit myself to driving no more than about 200 miles a day, something like that. Or the length of time for which I'm sitting in the driving position causes me a lot of pain. As a result, I needed to find a way to do the trip so that we could do an overnight stay, to break the amount of driving into manageable pieces for me. The obvious way to do that would be an overnight stay up in Lancashire. Drive up one day and back the next. However, that makes the trip much more complex for my mum, who can find planning ahead a bit stressful. Don't get me wrong, she can do overnight stays, but it takes quite a lot of planning for her to have everything that she needs with her. And as I say, she finds that a bit stressful, so it felt like a day trip was a better approach. It would be much easier for her if I picked her up in the morning, do the journey as a day trip and drop her back in the evening. So that was my plan. In order to achieve that without doing too much driving in one day, that meant organising two overnight stays for me. I would drive up to stay in a hotel near Mum's on a Friday evening. Then we would do the day trip on the Saturday. I would go back to the hotel that night before driving home again on the Sunday. I spotted an opportunity to do the trip on a weekend when I already needed to be near Mum's as I had booked to see a comedy gig with my brother on the Saturday night. That felt like an efficient use of time and of CO2 emissions and things seemed to be falling into place for it to happen that weekend. Staying in a hotel near Mum's is not something I've done before so that took a bit of planning. I had to choose a reasonable hotel and one with charging for the car, of course. Booking.com supports EV journeys by allowing filtering of accommodation based upon charging. There are quite a few hotels in the area with charge points, but in the majority of cases there is only a single charge point. I'm not generally keen to limit myself to a single charge point. That doesn't give you much by way of options if it's in use or out of order. So I looked for an alternate approach. Another option was to look at charging in a public car park. I found a car park in the area with about a dozen charge points, so that seemed like a good place to head. And a hotel a couple of minutes away from the car park was a very reasonable price, so I went ahead and booked that. And so with the planning done, we get to the weekend. How did it all go? Is it possible to do a long journey in an EV without waiting indefinitely for it to charge? On the Thursday night, I charged the car to 100%. That wasn't strictly necessary as I was only doing 100 miles on the Friday, but public charging is much more expensive than home charging, so it would save me a bit of money. I drove up to the hotel on the Friday evening and that all went well. I found the car park very easily although it did take a while to find the charge points. After a while, I realised there might be a little wrinkle in the plan. On the way into the car park, I had noticed that one of the levels was closed, which at first I didn't think anything about. But by the time I'd reached the fifth level and not found a charge point, I started to wonder if that was relevant. Sure enough, that closed floor is where the majority of the charge points are located in this car park. However, there are still a couple on a floor that is still open, so I used one of those. I plugged in and got charging straight away without any problem. 
It is unfortunate that the charging apps say that there are lots of operational charge points in the car park, which is probably true, they probably are. But of course they are inaccessible, due to what appears to be a structural issue with the car park. However, it didn't cause me a problem. And there were plenty of other options. There are lots of car parks with AC charge points in that area, as is the case in most towns and cities these days. Charging overnight would make for a very easy journey, but DC rapid charging the following morning was also a possibility. And again, there are lots of options for that as well. The following morning, I picked mum up and we got on our way. The journey up went pretty well, and we got as far as keel services before taking a break. After a short comfort break, we got on our way again. The traffic was pretty kind to us, and we got to our destination on time. Having used just over 50% charge, I think we might have been on 48% or so from memory. It was a cool 9 to 11 degrees that day, which limits the car's range a bit. The visit was lovely. It was great to see everyone, and we had meat and potato pies, salmon sandwiches and trifle for afters, before popping to the hospital to see my uncle, who seemed well. We even saw a cousin I haven't seen for a very long time, which was a lovely bonus. We started the journey home at about 3.30, exactly as intended. And whilst I reckoned we might be able to make it back to my mum's without charging, it was very tight and there was no need to risk it. When looking the night before, I had spotted that Sandbatch services has been upgraded to have a whole bunch of chargers. Sandbatch ended up being a bit earlier in the journey than I had expected, but I decided we would stop there for a quick break anyway. At the services, I headed for the original medium speed chargers, as they are generally close to the entrance to the building. And the Zoe can only charge at 46 kilowatts at best, so being on a high power charger is not a benefit. I popped the car on charge and we headed into the services for a comfort break. Mum is not a particularly fast mover these days, so a trip to the toilet and getting a takeaway coffee took us 15 minutes. That's just the fastest we can do. When we got back to the car, we were only charging at 27 kilowatts. I think because the battery might have been a bit colder than would have given us a good charging speed. But we'd gone from 35% to 51% during the stop, which was plenty. I decided to wait a couple of minutes to see an extra percent come up, and in fact after two minutes we'd hit 53% and put 8 kilowatt hours in in total. So I unplugged and we got on going again. The rest of the journey back was fairly uneventful, although we hit very slow traffic as we got closer to Mum's. But I dropped her off at just after 6pm and headed to the hotel where I put the car on charge again. I made it back to the car park with 18% charge remaining and a 40 mile buffer. That's pretty much what we'd put in while stopped at Sandbach, so we might have made it without charging. But we were always going to stop anyway for a comfort break, so there was no point in risking it. Plugging in while stopped was just a sensible precaution, making the remainder of the journey easy, with no need to even think about range. With the car on charge that evening, I walked over to the venue to meet my brother and got there in plenty of time to get a drink and catch up with him before the show, and then enjoyed a great show and a post-show chatter in a local pub. The following day was a relaxed affair. I chose to move the car off the charge point so that someone else could use it if need be, and wander around a local museum. Once I'd finished there, including a spot of lunch, I headed back home. The journey back included a stop for a break, as I was pretty tired by that point and wanted to stretch my legs. The car was fully charged from the night before, of course, so I didn't need to plug it in. It was rather that I needed to recharge my batteries. So all in all, the trip went very well. The driving all went to plan and the timings all worked out nicely. My back has been a little sore this week, but not significantly so so there was very little downside. The journey was about 400 miles all in, and using an electric car to do it was pretty much incidental in the grand scheme of things. Getting the timings right and dealing with the traffic was the focus of my attention that weekend, not whether the car would cause a problem. 
The format of that journey was of course fairly unusual. Doing two nights in a hotel is not something that many people would do, but it was made necessary by a limitation in how far I can drive in a day, not what the car can do. Because of that format, charging was pretty much a non-event. Most of my charging was done overnight, exactly as I do for my daily use. Stopping at Sandbach for about 17 minutes fitted with the brake we were going to have anyway, and I only waited a couple of extra minutes to give us a bit more of a buffer. That buffer would prove to be unnecessary, as I got back to the hotel with pretty much exactly the charge we put in on that stop. But having a bit extra meant I could avoid any need to think about range on the remainder of the trip at all. Why put yourself in a situation where you need to worry? And as it happens, it got us a prime parking space close to the entrance to the services, which minimised the amount of walking Mum needed to do to get in and out again. As I say though, this is not the format that most people would choose. Doing an overnight at the destination is certainly an option, but as I mentioned, I chose not to do that because it would be more stressful for Mum. So what else might people do? Well, I can imagine that my brother would probably do the whole journey as a day trip, the whole 400 miles or so. That's an awful lot of driving for one day, but he's done quite a lot of long drives as part of his job. So I don't think he'd be concerned about doing that. How would a journey like that work in an EV? We can use a website called A Better Route Planner. That's abetterrouteplanner.com to map out how a journey like that would go. In a Renault Zoe, you'd need to do over two hours of charging across three charging stops, the longest of which is almost an hour. That's not at all convenient. But we have to remember that the Renault Zoe is a very old design. Although it has had tech upgrades in its life to give it more range, the charging speed is limited by the thermal management decisions made at the start of its life. It was designed to be an affordable city car and compromises had to be made to achieve that so long ago. We should not think that it was optimised for this sort of trip. When considering what EVs are capable of, we need to remember that the technology has progressed significantly in the last 10 years. So we need to look at what something more modern is capable of. If you are the sort of person who wants to do 400 miles of driving in a day, then choose something intended to do that. Let's have a look at something more representative of a more recent design. At the moment, the best cars for long distance trips are still Teslas. They do the best thermal management and benefit from the best charging network. So let's see what a Tesla Model Y would do. A better route planner says that a Model Y, in the conditions we experienced, can do that journey with just two stops, a total charging time across those stops of just 28 minutes, the longest of which is only 18 minutes. What is more, you can play with that plan to suit your needs. You would be able to adjust the lengths of those stops to more closely match what you wanted to do, including making them a bit more even in length if you wanted to. But Teslas are not the only cars capable of these sorts of journeys and a Kia EV6 long range would need only a little more charging, a total of 37 minutes, with the longest stop being 19 minutes. I should note that I have found a better route planner to be a little bit pessimistic. I've always done a bit better than it has predicted, so bear that in mind when running these theoretical experiments for yourself using that website. So in summary, can EVs do long road trips? Well, yes, they certainly can. I've just done one myself, travelling 400 miles in just 48 hours as part of a very busy weekend. The format of my trip had to be adjusted to fit what I was capable of doing. The limitation that caused that unusual format was me and not the car. Newer cars are much more capable than the Zoe for those that can benefit from it. The limitations you might imagine are not really an issue in real world usage. It is common for the occupants to be the limiting factor, not the cars or the charging infrastructure. Thanks very much for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed the video. 
Your questions and comments on this subject are most welcome as ever. If you'd like the video, it's a help to me if you click the thumbs up button. That tells YouTube that you've enjoyed it, and YouTube may promote it to others based upon that. And of course, click subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks.